Uh, this is rehearsal with Roger, perhaps. So I'm sure you've heard over the last couple of weeks, we're getting a, just a, a whoever wants to join us, a little choir together, uh, to sing on Christmas Sunday, which actually comes early, um, 19th or something like that, but uh, whatever that date is. So we have two more weeks where we're gonna rehearse. And we, is anyone here, band right through, I, I want to say I don't care if you don't know how to sing, because you all know how to sing. And uh, we're going to be rehearsing at the in the, uh, the old songster room, the choir room, at the end of the hall on the right-hand side across from the fellowship room. Just come and we'll have some fun. We're not going to do anything elaborate. You don't have to be excellent readers. And uh, just uh, so we're going to start that next Sunday morning at 9.30. We'll rehearse for about a half an hour. A couple of little things that we got. Sylvia's going to be helping us with her uh, talent on the ivories, and uh, we're just going to have fun. And we'll be out of that room by 10 o'clock, so you can still come out and do all of the stuff that you're normally doing, all right? So please uh, think about that seriously and join us. It's, it's going to be fun, and uh, who knows what it will develop to. We probably won't sing every Sunday, but, uh, you know, maybe the next time is Easter or maybe before. We'll see. But uh, next Sunday, 9.30 in the at the end of the hall on the right hand side. So look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. And uh, what uh, happens now is the Advent wreath. And uh, uh, we've got uh, some readings that are going to take place. Uh, Michaela's going to help us on the PowerPoint, and her mom, Tracy, is going to come and uh, lead. So uh, we've got a leader, we've got people. That's all we need for an Advent reading. Oh, and we have fire. That's important as well. Good evening. As you follow ahead uh, above me on the screen for our uh, Advent reading, please. Um, the people will start. You join with me. to our fathers. We long for your ways, O oh God, the living of that path so we may walk in it. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. Let's read that uh, final slide together. Wonderful Counselor.
but it, it takes us around the world. And you know, if you took a quick trip around the world uh, just now, you'd see a lot of things going on with you. And uh, in my heart, as we, as we said the word floods, I was thinking about brothers and sisters in our country, in the West, who are, are battling and battling this morning. Can't go to church, so, so many. Uh, because their church is under water, pretty much. So um, we, we, we're reminded of the joy of Christmas, but we're also reminded, and today we're going to be looking at how God uses all of the events uh, in our world and in our lives to, to strengthen us and deepen us. There's the fourth verse. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove. Let's lift it up. <laughs> Thank you. 
as we quiet our hearts before you today. As we step aside from all of the things that would clamor for our attention. As we intentionally quiet our hearts. As we intentionally come into your presence corporately, but individually, right where we sit, right where we, right where we are, not just physically where we are, but spiritually and emotionally where we are. And we know that you desire to meet us there. Not in a place where we've cleaned up, prepared, spruced up, but right where we are. We're leaning on you this morning, seeking your presence, asking you to draw near, intentionally pressing in towards you. And we ask, Lord, that you will make yourself known to us today by your word, by your spirit, in our hearts as we gather. Lord, there are people that we mentioned this morning. We think about Dennis and his family. Sorry, Gary and his family. His dad and Dennis. Will you be right where they are this morning? Struggling, I'm sure. Fearful, I'm sure. Be their sufficiency today. We lift up Darlene today and ask that she'll just prepare her those who will care for her in the next days. And others in our families, other friends, who need our prayers, Lord, we take this moment to lift them to you. Your name is a strong and mighty town.
Thank you. That was uh, uh, that was amazing. Thank you. Uh, I, I mean, uh, there's something about Christmas carols. There's something about Christmas carols. Um, there are so many thoughts in my mind. I can hardly contain them all just now. But uh, let, let's let's start with uh, a, a warm welcome to Garland. They uh, come all the way from uh, the Niagara region in our area this morning. So thanks for coming, Garland. Nice to see you. Um, when I lit the Christmas Advent candle this morning, uh, what I noticed, what I remembered, it was this flashback. Did you ever have those, you know, certain smells and certain sights and certain things will cause your brain to just take a flip? Um, we were in uh, a church, uh, Sue and I were pastoring a church uh, in, uh, better not, you know, it was Listowel. It was Listowel. So if anybody from Listowel is watching, I kind of doubt it, but. Uh, Hey, to Listowel this morning. Our first Sunday into the building was Christmas Eve. And Sue went to the, you know how she is, she likes to decorate, she likes to do that stuff. Um, and, but she, she, she got these candelabra uh, for our Christmas Eve service, and it was amazing. And they had, it, was, it, it looked just amazing. We had like, I think, I don't know, 20, 20 candles on each one, I don't know. But the building was new, and they hadn't balanced the air systems yet. So we had the special lighting of the candle moment, and it was all so great. And then the air system came on. And the candles went from 12 inches to 1 inch in about 4 minutes. And of course, all of the wax from those candles didn't have a chance to burn off. It just all burned off and ran down on the brand new carpet of the new church. And... And, of course, so many were horrified. It was a great idea, It's It was a great idea. Uh, who knew? Who knew? <laughs> anyway, um, I'm sure you've got uh, good stories from Christmas's past uh, that uh, I just really pray uh, that given all of the things that are going on in our world, that you'll have a chance to, uh, to share some of those stories of Christmas past with with some of your family uh, this year. I pray that it won't be uh, like the last Christmas or so has been uh, with the pandemic. Scripture reading, 1 Peter, you'll appreciate we're coming into the final throes of 1 Peter, and I'm sure some of you are wondering why I wouldn't set it aside for Christmas, but I've got Christmas in my sights, and, and uh, we're going to finish this because uh, it's a goal of mine in my whole life. We're going to finish 1 Peter. This week, next week is the last sermon. I hope you look ahead and pay some, uh, some uh, time, spend some time looking at that. Here's our verses for today. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 to 7, just a couple of verses. It says, likewise, and you've seen that word before when we've studied 1 Peter, likewise, you younger people, you know who you are, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Let's pray. Father, we pray today that these words written by Peter, inspired by you, put on paper, passed down through the ages, bound in a book, Now in so many languages, in so many places, and even in our electronic devices, I pray that your word will do exactly what you've promised that it will do, that it will work in our lives to make change in our lives, and that we will hear your word, not mine. In Jesus' name, amen. So, it happened again this week, and it's happened so many times, I'm sure, to you, but uh, I stepped into a place of business this week. 
Uh, I walked through the doors, and I've done all the things I'm supposed to do. Uh, I even, and I don't always do this, but I had watched a person go into this place just before me, and he did that, uh, he did the door handle trick. You know it, right? Oh, well, let me teach you that. You pull your sleeve down, you get your hand inside your sleeve, you grasp the door with your sleeve, and you open the door that way. You've done it. You know you've done it. No, it's just me and that guy. Well, anyway, I did it. And I walked into the store, and I thought, okay, I've done, I, you know, just, I checked. Do you remember when it used to be that you'd walk into the store, and you realized, oh, I forgot my wallet? Do you remember that? Not anymore. It's, oh, I forgot my mask. Well, I had, I had the mask on. Everything was good. I'm four steps into the door, through the door, and into the building, when I'm approached by a rather not-so-nice person who said, Got any COVID symptoms? <laughs> and I was caught off guard. I didn't really know. I knew that I hadn't, and this person was just doing their job. And But I was kind of caught off guard because, as you know, some of those questions have relaxed a little bit. We're not asked as we go in the door. Like, so many things have changed. But anyway, I, I bumbled and stumbled on an answer. Uh, I think I said no. And, and then <laughs> the second, the second uh, piece of instructions, it, wasn't, it was an instruction, uh, was just as gruff as the first, and I didn't mean to scare you by my gruff voice there, but uh, she <laughs> said, hand sanitizer over there. Uh, I, I guess I walked past it. Now, all, of the, all this person was doing was their job, and doing it very well, i, I, I got to say. And I, I certainly don't mind complying. You know that much about me by now. I'm, I'm, I'm all about that. But there was this moment, and, and I don't know where it came from. Well, yes, I actually do. It's in the scripture today. There was this moment, and, and please, please hold this against me. Yeah, and check me on this. But there was this moment when I just wanted to turn tail and walk out. And, and I, I didn't do that. But, but I'm just confessing to you and to anybody that might be watching this online that I had that moment where I just wanted to, because she was kind of gruff, really gruff, really kind of gruff. I squirted the hand sanitizer on my hand. It smelled awful. It smelled like, didn't smell like anything I'd never smelled before. I smelled something between vinegar and roast beef. I don't know what it was. <laughs> anyway, and I, I did my very quick uh, little shop, and I won't tell you where it was because you won't go there. You should go there and support those people. But, uh, um, but there was this moment, and I think it was pride. I think it was pride. It was, it was sort of, I think it was pride uh, sort of attempting to overcome a little bit of embarrassment. Or, I'm not completely sure what it was, but it was there, and I'm confessing that it was Caught me on guard. First Peter today, as you notice, we're going to be talking about pride a little bit. And what I found as I went through studying for this this morning, we're going to need to spend some more time here, some other time, maybe on Sunday mornings, but maybe in a Bible study or something. There's a lot we need to understand about pride. There were some things I needed to understand about pride this past week, because I think that's what it was. Peter starts this passage with the word likewise. We've talked about likewise as we've studied through 1 Peter, if you've been listening with us. Likewise, so he says, what he's saying is, the stuff that I've just said just a few minutes ago, likewise. And if you look at the passage, what he was talking about, he was talking, remember last week, he was talking to elders. And we decided that elders weren't just old people, they're people with experience, people that, that, that uh, come to a task with with experience and ability and all those kinds of things. We're going to talk about that a little bit more today. But he says, likewise, you young people. And just like we decided last week that old people, older elders, were not necessarily all old, old people, young people might not necessarily all be just young people. We can attach to that word young in the faith, young in the church, Young and experience. All those come into that category. But what he says is, likewise, you young people, 
Submit yourselves to your elders. Now, if you were parenting, uh, you would, you would, uh, if, or if you were coaching parents, and I know that many, many of you do that, right? You've got kids who have kids. Isn't that the best? Like, I can't think of anything that brings me more joy than, than having grandkids, but also to be able to speak into my kids' lives as they figure out parenting. I had said to one of my, my, my people, <laughs> my sons, you know, when you get a new car, one of them did ask if I could take it for a drive. And then I'm going to give your kids a big bottle of milk and let them spill it all over the back of your car like you did to me. I mean, I can remember having to trade a car in because I couldn't get the smell of it from the sour milk underneath the seats. And I had this... See, so that's not kind. That's not the kind of parenting that I give to my kids. But, but what I'm saying to you, as elders, as older people, we get this amazing opportunity to speak into the lives of other younger, less experienced people. So younger people, submit to your elders. And not just because I say so, because they've earned the right. They've earned the right. That's why, I, that's why I hope I am with my kids. I hope I've earned the right to speak into their lives. I hope so. I don't want you to get teary on me, and I don't want to get teary on you, but let me say this. I would give an awful lot to have just one more hour with my grandfather. I would. There are so many things that I, I didn't really pay attention to that he was saying to me that I didn't really listen to. So I, I just come to visit that one more time. As Peter says to young people to submit to your elders, I want to just visit that just for one more minute and say, elders, those of you who have an influence over anybody, be somebody that people want to be influenced by. Don't be somebody that, that you know, beats people over the head with the message. Be accountable. And Peter does this for us, doesn't he? Right now. He says, yes. Okay, so I've talked to elders. and he's, He says, I've talked to younger people. But then he says this word. Yes, all of you. All of you. So while we want to just sort of segregate those messages into older and younger people. No, no. He's, he, he brings it all together like he does so often in 1 Peter. And he says, yes, all of you. All of you be submissive to one another. So the message that he's giving us is that we have, we have such a ministry to one another, to one another. I, I hope, I hope you'll uh, circle the words one another and maybe sometime uh, do a word search on one another. So many times, especially in the, in the epistles, that word, one of those two words, one another, come up. Certainly in Ephesians and Philippians and here in 1 Peter one another. We have this awesome privilege and responsibility to one another and for one another. Peter says, here's what he wants us to do with one another. And he says, be clothed with humility. Now this morning you did a thing, right? Thank you for that. Put your clothes on, you Got out of your night clothes, whatever they might be. You put your, you put your clothes on. Some of you got a Sunday uh, sort of a thing you put on, but you, you put your clothes on. And I want you to be thinking in that vein this morning, because what he's saying is, we want you to put humility on. Not, not, not. It's not a put on. It's not a fake thing. But put it on like a cloak. When Peter used this word, he was hearkening in his in his language back to where he had said earlier in 1 Peter to gird up the loins of your mind. The idea back there was that we've got some really, really tough slugging to do. We've got some things that we've got to do that it's gonna, not going to be easy. So what he was instructing us back in the first chapter of 1 Peter was to gird up the loins of your mind. So these loincloths that, that they would have worn in those days, well, impossible to work with those on impossible to run with those on. And in this regard, it's kind of what he's saying. He wants us to, to put on a cloak, put it on like clothes, cover yourself. Cover yourself 
with humility. I thought about this and I, I chose not to do it, but think about if I did this and, and ask you, please don't do this, okay? I'm just gonna say it out loud. I want you to think about what your response might be. But what imagine if imagine if I asked you, please raise your hand if you're humble. So then I'd flip the question over and please raise your hand if you're filled with pride. Well, based on what we've been talking about, I guess I better not. I guess you know the right answer, right? Whenever you don't know the right answer, you know the right answer. Check your shoes. Right? Just look down your shoes, that's what you do. If you don't know the just look at your shoes. If it's the right answer, just look at your shoes. Okay, it wasn't that funny in my study either, but uh, okay. Are you humble? Well, here's the thing. And Peter, uh, Peter quotes here, and I, I've told you that in the letter of 1 Peter, he quotes scripture a lot of times. The version that I like to read, the New King James, uh, 11 times Peter actually pulls a scripture from somewhere else and brings it into his writing. And here he's looking back to Proverbs 3, uh, the 34th verse. And he says this. Why should we be clothed with humility? Well, because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, I want to do this little, uh, I want to do this little trick with you. I'm going to turn my Bible back two pages. I know if you're electronic, that's hard to do. But if I just turn back two pages to the book of James, and I look at James chapter 4, and I look at the sixth verse, you know what I'm reading here? God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So within four pages in my Bible, this scripture verse is quoted two times, and it's from Proverbs. The Bible is, it has threads all through it about pride and humility, which I think makes it important for, enough for us to maybe, maybe look at that in the spring, uh, perhaps, in a, in a couple of sermons, perhaps. Um, we'll see. But I want you to just zero in on that verse for a moment from Proverbs. God resists the proud. Now, in a few minutes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I've got a couple of lists that I want to share with you. I've been looking at, you know, sort of some pride and humility contrasts. But, but think about that line. God resists the proud. Now, think about resistance. If you, you can open the word up a little bit, and it's opposition. It's, it's opposing. God opposes or, or resists the proud. Now, if you've ever led anything, even your family, uh, maybe especially your family. You, you've, you've met some resistance. You've got an idea. You know that it's a good idea. And you offer that idea, and you get some resistance in your family. You can take that wherever you want, can't you? You've got a good idea at work. You present that idea, but you get some pushback on the idea. It never happens in the church, does it? Of course it does. You got a good idea, you present that to somebody, and there's a bit of pushback on it. It's one of those moments, isn't it? It's one of those moments where you gotta protect yourself. You gotta, you gotta think about pride. You know, it, that can just, resistance can bring up pride. It can. But let's back this back up on this verse. God resists the proud. I would welcome. I would welcome resistance from almost anybody but God. Because he's going to win every time, isn't he? The last thing, the very last thing in my life that I would ever want is that God is in resistance to me. That God is somehow resisting me. He's going to win. I am not going to. Doesn't matter what value that is or what what attitude that is, God is going to win when it comes to him opposing me. And it's the very last place in my walk with God that I would ever want to be, that God is resisting. But you've felt it, haven't you? You're pursuing something in your life. You're going down a particular road towards a particular thing or a particular goal that you want to 
we want to get to. Nothing seems to be going in the right direction. Could that be God resisting the idea? You've decided you're going to do this. It doesn't matter who thinks anything of it, but you meet with resistance. Could that be God resisting? I think we have to pay attention and remember that, that when it comes to our lives, God decides, and he said it so many times through scripture, that he'll resist us. He will resist us. Put up resistance. Okay, you can breathe now, because the second half of the verse is pretty nice, isn't it? But he gives grace to the home. He gives grace. We could spend all day on He gives grace. We could get testimonies from you. When has, have you experienced His grace? When have you sensed that He was just, for some unreal, un, unrealizable reason, He was being gracious to you? That's His value. That's what He does. And we're told here in this portion of Scripture that humility, humility in your life and in my life, brings a response. You can almost feel the cool air, can't you? And you can, you can see the contrast between a pride-filled life and a humble life, a life of humility. So in verse 6, Peter says, therefore, and I won't have to remind you too many more times, but when you see the word therefore, you better figure out what it's there for. So because God opposes pridefulness, and rewards humility with grace. Because of that, humble yourselves. Be about the intentional task of humbling yourself. Now, I want to talk about that for a minute, in a minute. Because when I started thinking about that, that's, that's a tricky maneuver. Humble yourself. Because if you're going to try to humble yourself, that can look prideful. Can it? And if you say, I'm humble, or I'm, I'm being humble, that's kind of proud. So it's a tricky business, and we're going to talk about it in just a minute. But Peter's instruction is because God opposes pridefulness in your life, and because God rewards humility in your life with his grace, intentionally pursue humility under his mighty hand, Peter says. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. When we think about the mighty hand of God, I want you to think about his ability to, to direct, direct in your life. His ability to direct in your life. Now, we're on the way still through the pandemic, steering our way through. Like I said, even, even this week, I was bumped by a, by a, a new thing that I had to, to deal with. And it's not a new thing, but I was surprised by it. We've been surprised so many times. And as we steer our way through, I can remember at the beginning days of this pandemic asking God, is this you? Have you done this? This is not nice. It's not good. And I had to be reminded one more time that we live in a broken world. We live in a world where things are not going to be golden streets there is a place, and we can sing about it, we can read about it, but that's not here. It's a very imperfect place. Things happen. People get sick. Floods take place. And you are in that under his mighty hand. Under his mighty hand. He has the ability to take you through things that others who don't know about his mightiness and his grace may not get through the same way as you get through them. God has the ability to take situations that we certainly don't understand and change our hearts in the middle of those situations. He has that ability. It's how he works. So Peter is not off base saying, because of how God works with the prideful and the humble. Intentionally put yourself under his mighty hand. When tough time comes, remember you're under his mighty hand. 
when, when trials come, when suffering comes, remember, he has you under his mighty hand. He has a purpose in all of your life. Humble yourself under his mighty hand that in due time, the right time, we can translate that, he will lift you up. There's a song that we'll sing sometimes, but uh, it says, uh, he, he, it's from this verse, he lowers us to raise us that we might sing his praises. He humbles us that lifts us up. God is able to come alongside of you, in fact, underneath you in those trials of life. But they're not fun, are they? The tough stuff is not easy. The tough stuff is not, not something that we would welcome. And we certainly wouldn't ask God to make our life tougher so that we can be more humble. We wouldn't ask for that. So God also realizes as Peter was writing, Peter was writing and saying, oh, but that's a tough thing, to come under God's mighty hand, to be able to submit to him in the midst of those hard times, not going to be easy. So his next line, casting all your care, all your anxiety, all your worry, casting all of those things that would cause you to falter in your walk with him, cast them all upon him. how the Greek would read. You are in his care. You can care for things, can't you? You can care about things. But when it comes to you and God, you are in his care. That's how he sees you. So as we do this little assessment on our lives, I thought it would be interesting to, well, you know, if you got a question, you know what you do, right? You Google it. Of course you do. Let me tell you this. If you Google the, the phrase, and now it could just be algorithms, and maybe somebody can talk to me about that later. It could be just that, that the, the internet world knows so much about my brain that they just took me here. But when I Google the sentence, problem of pride in my life, it took me to spiritual things, not business or world things. Now, in my researching, I thought, well, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? It kind of says to me, because if I, was a, if I was a person of the world, I didn't have faith, and I Googled, and somebody at work said, hey, you know what, you might have a problem with pride. And I Googled, just Google that. I have a problem with pride. Hit the enter button. What comes up on my screen is going to be important to me. But you know what, if it's a sermon, or something from the church, or something from the Bible, I'm not going to pay attention to that if I'm not a believer. But that's all that came up. It made me think that the world doesn't think about pride the same way as you and I would. Because it's a problem. Let me run down the list. I think I've got nine. I'd really like ten. So if you want to send me number ten, that'd be great. Okay? Don't flood my inbox with prideful things. But here are some pride problems. And I may just make a list as we close the sermon. Our possessions. Our stuff can become a problem, can it? If we get prideful about it. Our abilities, the things that we're really good at, because we can hide there and not come out of that zone, our abilities can become a pride problem. Our accomplishments. And the problem here, and we're going to look at it next week, the problem here is that all of these things can devil can get his foot in that door and cause these things to go off track. As good as our accomplishments can be, if that's all we ever talk about or all we ever think about or all we ever pursue, our accomplishments can be a pride problem. Our status, who we are in the structure of things can be a problem. Our demands, the things that we must have, otherwise life can't continue in my world. Our need to control can become a pride problem. Our comparisons, you know, are your Christmas lights as nice as the neighbors? You better fix that. Can we have a pride problem? 
or appearance. I didn't want to go there. Because <laughs> you all look so nice. But our appearance, people's appearance can be a pride problem. Our knowledge, how much we know, can become a pride issue. On the other side of the page, I made a list. They're not, they're not to cancel each other out, but I made a list of, of humble habits. Things that perhaps might tweak something in your mind that you could pursue today. Things that you could pursue today that would pursue humility in your life. How about situational awareness? Being aware of what's going on around you with the people that are around you. Paying attention to what's going on in other people's lives. Retaining relationships. Being, being intentional about making sure that the relationships in your life are going in the right direction not the wrong direction. I'll move quickly. I'm sure you're, not, you're, you're ready to be done with this, but put others first. Intentionally. In humility. And maybe they didn't even know it. Listen. Just listen. Sometimes I don't have to talk. Be curious. At number six, be curious, ask questions, like not demeaning questions, but questions that show the other person that you're genuinely interested. Say thank you. Goes without saying, no it doesn't. Just say thank you. Accept feedback, kind of talked about that this morning earlier. Assume responsibility, even if it's not, even if it's not, if it's a little awkward. Assume responsibility. Maybe for the mistakes that you might have made. Ask for help. There it is. The older I get, the more help I need, the less I want to ask for it. You know? All the things that I used to be able to do on my own, thank you very much. Moving the 300 pound wall unit up and down the stairs by myself, that's not that smart. It wasn't smart then, and it's even less smart now, isn't it? I didn't do that, by the way. Face difficult situations. Friends, we met and continue to go through a time when it's a challenge. We can just look at the pandemic, but you know what? If we were to do a quick poll through the room, every one of you this, this week probably has a challenge that you're looking at. In the midst of those times, will you come under his mighty hand? Will you intentionally let him care for you? When worry comes upon you, will you cast that in front of him, not just shoulder it yourself? Oh, I pray that you will. He cares for you. God resists he is so ready to give grace to the home. Let's pray together. Now as we pray, we're going to uh, think about this song that really points to that idea of worry. Cast all your cares on me. All your anxiety, all your cares, Bring to the mercy seat. Leave it there. Never a burden he will not bear. Never, never a burden he cannot care about. God cares for you. Beyond your ability to understand, I think. Beyond your ability even to care for others, God cares.
places where we need to intentionally turn towards humility. Will you show us the way? And Lord, when life, when life brings upon us the things that it does, will you help us to remember that we are captured, we are cared for under your mighty hand. You care more for us than we are even able to imagine. So as those things come into our lives, help us to cast them before you. All those things that are caring, careful, anxious things. Help us to bring them to you. Help us to remember that you are there to carry our burden with us. You are our friend. Let's lift up the third verse. Cease from walking close beside me. 
have I grieved thee with an ill-kept vow? In my heart of hearts have I denied thee? Speak, Lord, speak and tell me now by the blood that never ceased to hold me. What I want you to do is stand. We're going to sing the third verse that says, by the blood that never ceased to hold me. The third verse, let's stand together and share this uh, beautiful song. Our example in these days in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.